Matthew, what are you looking at? I was looking at the uh, company scorecard. Okay. Isn't that what we're talking about? Correct. All right, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of 300 to 3000. I am one of your hosts, Spencer Sutton, and I got with me Matthew Whitaker. Matthew, welcome back to the show, man. I'm glad to be here. Pretty pumped. We're up here on a Saturday recording. Uh, we were supposed to record on a Friday and didn't didn't make it happen. So as all property managers know, every now and then you got to work a Saturday to get it all done. That's right. Uh, I just, when I did that intro, I, I thought about Gray. I listened to Gray, um, hosted one of our podcasts yesterday. And so I listened to his intro and it was uh, very similar to my intro. So it's kind of funny to listen to him try to <laughs> He's yeah. not used to doing that. Well, I mean, if you if if somebody didn't hear that, they would think they were listening to the wrong podcast. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I think last time I hosted one, I did something like that, too. So mm, probably. Yeah. All Imitation, right. So let's uh, imitation is the greatest form of flattery, right? Who's that? Gray imitating you. No, I'm kidding. I was like, who's that other voice? Uh, it's <laughs> Graham Robinson. Graham, welcome to the show, mm -hmm. man. Hey, thanks for having me. It only took you about a year and a half to finally get the invite. Appreciate it. Well, well as we you know, to make sure you weren't where you were going to stick, stick around. For this. <laughs> and as you know, I felt bad. Like I was hanging out with your parents about a month ago and, um, I thought, man, we really need to have him on the show because his parents would be so proud. So here we are. That's what we're doing right now. Um, you know, Graham's going to bring a ton of value, but it's really making his parents happy. Definitely. My mom is super proud to be listening right now. She's going to be pumped. <laughs> Hey, so before we get going and introduce our subject and talk to Graham, I did want to say, Matthew, we just had a webinar. Uh, it went really, really well. We had about 220 people register, 122 showed up, and we have the replay. So we're excited about that. We have another one coming March 2nd. That is Thursday, March 2nd. It's going to be at 3 o'clock Central to 5 o'clock, and it's going to be all about sales. We even, uh, we even have a few sales pros joining us for that webinar. Yeah, we have some people committed that are known in the industry, uh, that have a big sales background. So really excited they're going to be joining us. In fact, they're kind of from competing businesses. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it might even get spicy on the on the webinar. <laughs> so you, you will not want to miss this. That's right. So go to our, go to our registration page. That's evernest.co slash webinar and you'll see a link there and uh you can sign up and look forward to it all right let's let's kick this one off matthew uh what are we going to be talking about today yeah so um as most people know I me mean, we talked about graham on the podcast he's been here for 18 or so months as he just mentioned uh we pulled him out of austin texas and if you know how hard it is to pull anybody out of texas uh we were just presenting how big this opportunity was to come work with me and you so um <laughs> we, we we he bought it hook line and sinker and here he is um, he's even an alabama fan now that's the great thing he loves alabama whoa, there's whoa, whoa. like there's alabama no state there's not, lines to, not uh, university not university and uh, so Graham came over to run our president role. Uh, he's he's kind of responsible. The way we've this has kind of worked out is he's responsible for the uh, most of the services we provide into our property management business. And so he's also helping us build out our technology uh, running point on that. And I can't tell you, like uh, all kidding aside, Graham has been a tremendous asset to this team and um he he's really brought like a different uh skill set to Evernest and is uh a big part of what happened last year when we tripled the business uh in 2022. So Graham, uh you've already spoken but want to welcome you to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Excited to get to talk about uh something I'm pretty passionate about and uh yeah, thanks for for finally making it happen, Spencer. Yeah, you know, I didn't even know how many questions we weren't asking until Graham showed up uh, at Evernest because <clears throat> he asked the absolute best questions. I love it. Tons of value, adds tons of value. So this kind of it it kind of segues into what we're going to be talking about today with scorecards. Yeah, scorecards and data and KPIs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, we're big EOS fans and have started converting some to scaling up, although we, we haven't made the conversion that we thought we would make by this point. Uh, but 
uh, one of the big things about um, both both of them is the whole idea of making sure that you have a pulse on what's going on with your business. And so we're going to talk to Graham about that. And so like, let's just take it from the 20,000 foot view, Graham. Uh, my first question is, you know, how, how do you think about KPIs? How do you think about data and what should people, what's kind of like step one for people to start with? Uh, I think that step one is to remind your team that there is a score, right? Uh, nobody wants to go out and play basketball or play golf or go for a run and, you know, not keep score. I mean, I think my uh, first grade son, his basketball, they don't keep score, but um, beginning next year and for the rest of life, uh, there are scores. And so, you know, if you've got team members that aren't motivated by scores, then they may not be A players. A players tend to be highly motivated by winning or losing. And to know if you're winning or losing, you got to know what the score is. Just know that when I play basketball against Spencer, he doesn't keep score either. So that's that <laughs> there is a there is an edge case to that. Because I don't want to embarrass you. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is really important, Matthew. I'd like to ask you what what kind of scorecard did you have? 10 years ago when you first started the business like so you started with 30 properties what what was important to you besides the cash balance in the bank i was yeah that was about it that was, <laughs> there was only one score back then um yeah look i i would go back to like when we started eos that was about eight and a half years ago when the business is really small it's pretty easy to have uh because everything goes through you you have a pulse on everything that's going on and as the business starts to grow, you start to lose touch with certain bits of the business. Although once you push, you know, getting up to 300 homes, you, you, rel you know, pretty much everything that's going on in the business. Um, so when we read EOS, the way I looked at it, uh, which is very similar to the way Graham thinks about it is, um, and, and, and Gino Wickman in EOS says this, he says, you know, if you're on a desert Island, what 10 numbers or eight or 12, you know, keep it keep it fairly simple, but what weekly numbers, if you only got a carrier pigeon to bring you data once a week, how would you know what was working and what was not working back at home? And so really tried to uh, think about like, think about dashboards and KPIs, especially just the, the, the simple company scorecard, the whole company scorecard through that lens. And we actually still look at the whole business through that lens and have a company scorecard um, that we're trying to answer that same question. And um, it has a lot of red on it. Uh, it has a lot of, uh, has some green. Um, and, uh, you know, we put in all the the formulas that pop it up red if something's off track. But, uh, you know, again, taking a step back, it's what are, what are the 10 things you would need to know if you were just completely disconnected and only got reported to one, per, one time per week? You know, Matthew, as a business owner, and I think it's important for the, the team to know too, you know, you kind of joked about it, but we still, we still track, is my cash balance bigger this week than it was last week, right? And there's obviously cycles inside of a month, you know, two payrolls a month, et cetera, you know, paying management fees and that probably that first week of, uh, of the month, but, you know, is your economic model working? It truly, are you growing your cash balance? Um, I also think about just survival and I was listening to something that, uh, Munger and Buffett were saying, and just, you know, time carries most of the weight. And I was thinking about, you know, what if your, your, uh, property management SaaS platform crashed, or there was some sort of like major outage and you couldn't pay management fees to yourself. Um, do you have enough money in the bank to make a payroll or two payrolls, et cetera? And so just think about survival and um, just making sure that you can continue to live on to the next month and the next month, the next month before anything else, before you try to kind of like dive in deep on any other part of your business. I, th I think that's actually like a very useful KPI to track. And do you think that's giving me anxiety just talking <laughs> to you about it? Do you think that's why most property managers, uh, you know, when they're smaller? So I would imagine a lot of our audience is somewhere between, you know, 100 to 500 doors. Uh, do you think that's why, why when they're smaller, the owner is doing most of the work, right? So it's, it's you know, you're not hire, out there hiring a bunch of people to do all that. Um, 
and like you said, Matthew, they know pretty much instinctively what's happening with the cash. I mean, I know that's how you did it when you first started. You were just looking at the balance, the bank balance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Look, I mean, when you first get started, you just, you absolutely know everything that goes on because everything, all information flows through you, right? It's the whole like idea of our podcast is once the information can't all go through you and typically for property managers, that's from two to 400 homes. What's next? What do you do then? And how do you basically keep the same pulse on the business that you had when everything did go through you? And so, um, you know, just digging into those numbers and digging into um, the company scorecard. Uh, what, what, in fact, why don't we do that? Why don't we kind of like look at what what a general company scorecard might look like for for a um, for a company? Are you okay with that? Or I did I leave y'all? Uh, yeah, well, I thought you were about to share your screen or something. We were all going to sit here and look at it, but uh, well, I can see Graham's yes. prepared and logged in, unlike you, who just shows up and uh, you know wings it. Uh, well, all listen, right, so you two, you two are the experts, so I'm a hundred percent leaning on you. So, Graham, let's talk about this. What yeah. are you? You've already said bank balance, right? Cash in the bank. What What's the next thing that people really need to be focused on? Well, I, just as an aside, I think it's interesting, you know, Matthew, looking at ours, uh, the biggest bucket, we've got 20 KPIs on there. And the biggest bucket right now is our HR related, right? It's uh, we're obviously a very fast growing business. And so um, we need and want a players on this team. And so the, uh, the HR bucket, how quickly are we filling positions? Um, you know, how many people are we kind of like adding or losing in any given week? And then some of the um, the cultural things, we obviously believe culture is extremely, extremely important to our business. And so those are six of our 20 KPIs. Uh, yeah, I love Dan. I think we've got a few too many on here, but <laughs> but agree that uh, people are important and, and, and it becomes, you know, how you treat your team becomes how they treat your customers. And so making sure that we are doing a great job of, um, of managing that is, is super important. And and it's also around the growth of our team. We have some canaries in the coal mine, as Graham told me. I used to say canaries in the mine shaft, but uh, Graham corrected me yesterday. Uh, that's Graham's pretty detailed, and so when I say <laughs> wrong things, he, he he corrects me. He probably asked you a question like, "What are you saying?" Like that doesn't even make sense. Yeah. Well, he knew what I meant, but um, but the other thing is we have some data on here that says if our core focus is to develop people are we doing a good job of that or are people buying into that? And so, um, we have, uh, we have a weekly meeting that's ask anything. That's an all hands meeting. We, we basically measure attendance to that. We have our 250 K club, which we've talked about on here, which is our leadership development. You know, what percentage of our team is doing that content? Um, and then, you know, we have uh, one-to-ones, which are really important to us, uh, you know, making sure that we're developing people in a one-to-one -one environment, you know, what percentage of those are done on a 30-day cadence. So point being is, um, you know, we, we, we're, you know, number one, just like Graham uh, mentioned, is we're very focused on people and want to know that we're moving our core focus along. Next up on that list, kind of the, the next biggest bucket, um, we've been really focused on our maintenance business. And so uh, maintenance has five KPI, KPIs on there. Um, we do obviously upfront renovations. And so we're looking at the renovation business and you know, making sure we're staying on track with billing. And so looking at the, the maintenance dollars that we're billing. And then um, with our maintenance technicians, so the guys that are you know doing the two to four hour work orders, um, you know, how many do we have? Are they working 40 hours a week? Uh, are we making sure that, you know, 38 of those hours are billable? So a utilization and realization kind of metric. And, and then, you know, jumping from maintenance people, I think the next ones kind of like the next thing we're, we're going to go through is probably applicable, applicable, uh, to most people here that are listening. Um, the first one is just lost properties, right? You want to make sure that you're identifying lost properties. Uh, this is a great place to drop it down into a level 10. If you're losing properties in a certain area, um, you know, they're, they're basically leaking out of the bucket. 
uh, maybe it's a people problem, maybe it's a process problem, but you want to make sure that anybody that turns in notice that that's uh, definitely one of your KPIs. And we have kind of like a lost property weekly goal. Um, it's kind of weird to think uh, that you're just going to lose properties. And uh, we're at the size now where we kind of expect to lose properties. Um, some of that's just natural churn. Some of it's when Evernest screws things up, but we just want to make sure that we're digging in and not, uh, not fooling ourselves there. We also have um, a lost properties and what we call owner onboarding. Um, it, you know, when, when, when a person signs a management agreement with us, we think of them as a very fragile client at that point. And how do we make sure that we're uh, giving them enough love and enough touches that uh, we're bringing them into, um, into our system? And we don't really recognize them as a client until their house is leased. And um, as many of you know on this podcast that um, once the house is leased, it's definitely a, 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 you know, that's, that's a pretty solid client at that point. And hey, Matthew, uh, something else about churn that I think is important is to track, um, as best you can, why it happened and then where the client went, uh, afterwards, right? So what were the inputs? What caused that client to, you know, was it, Hey, we were a perfect property management company and it was truly just, you know, that five-year tenant finally moved out. The, the home had appreciated some, you know, extreme amount and the owner decided to sell or were there things that, you know, that Evernest could have done better that ultimately led to that owner choosing to sell that property or did we drive them into the arms of a competitor or is the owner going to, you know, they moved back to Birmingham. Now they're going to self-manage that property. Um, so what caused the churn and um, what's the outcome? Are they self-managing? Did the owner move in? Did they go to a competitor? Did they sell the property, et cetera? I think this is really important because the bigger you get, and the less involved the owner is. So like Matthew was saying, the owner is very, very in touch with all of this when it's smaller. But as you grow, you're trusting these property managers. And so to foster a culture of transparency, and you know, we would rather people say, hey, I screwed up here. Like I made the owner mad and tell us the reason and understand the reason and how we can improve. But to do that, there's got to be a lot of trust. And so your property manager has to completely trust you as an owner that, hey, if they come to you and say, hey, I lost this owner, there were 14 properties and I screwed up because I didn't do X, Y, Z. Like you need to have that type of relationship where you can learn from it and get better and not, not them try to cover it up because in property management, there's all kinds of ways to cover things up. Is this a uh, five dysfunctions of a team podcast? As well? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't couldn't agree more, <clears throat> Spencer. I, I totally agree that um, that it takes a certain level of trust. And 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 you know, if property managers are hustling, you need to give them grace because this is a very hard business, and it's a uh, you know it's very difficult to to execute uh, at a hundred percent all the time. Uh, the other the the next two are around kind of like sales and leasing. Um, you know, we have a median days on market that we're tracking. And uh, we, we kind of expect some seasonality with that. And, and so tracking how, what is our median days on market of our available homes right now. And so making sure that doesn't, you know, from a week to week, doesn't go too high. Um, and then line 12 right there is a really important one. Uh, Spencer's in charge of it. He has his name by it. Uh, Spencer is in charge of retail gained properties. I'm also recognizing now that nobody's fixed the formula on this and you've been below the right number the last couple of months, a couple, couple of weeks, uh, yeah, but it's still weeks. showing up as white. So I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't, don't know, know how to change. I don't know how to change the conditional formatting. So I need somebody to help me. He doesn't, he doesn't know how to change it, but he just removes it, uh, to make sure that it shows up. <laughs> no, this is, I, 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 so I look at this number, I'm not running sales anymore, uh, but I, but we do get this number and uh, this is very, very important. And and then, you know, because we're in different markets, you need to understand like, are there any abnormalities that we're noticing any, any markets that for several weeks have not brought on any properties. And then look at that in, in relation to how many leads they're getting, because that could like lead you back to, well, is this a sales problem? Is this a quality of lead problem? 
you want to be able to diagnose that. Um, but yeah, properties in uh, is, is obviously very, very important. And then we also have a brokerage business. So we have a line there for uh, broker brokerage properties under contract uh, on a weekly basis. And we, we track that. Um, so that's what I would say, generally speaking, is the uh, corporate, the company scorecard. And we look at that as a leadership team every week before our leadership level 10 on Tuesday afternoons. Uh, one of the things I'd like to kind of like explain to everybody is, as we've scaled the business, how we've thought about these level 10 meetings, right? Because at some point you've got this like organization, of like 20 people in one level 10, and all of a sudden you need to start breaking this up into, you know, different level 10s. And that was one of the biggest challenges we had as we were growing was thinking through this whole level 10 meeting cadence uh, and level 10 meeting, like who participates in what and where do we break it up? And so the first breakup I would say is like when you're really small, like everybody's in the leadership, but as you start to grow and you start to feel that some people aren't contributing and you're, you're and and not that they don't want to contribute, but you may have too many people. Ray Dalio says uh, five plus or minus two. So the meaning, you know, three to seven people in a meeting is the, is the most productive. And as you push into like nine, 10, 11, then you probably need to break that up. And the first breakup I would say is breaking it up in the, in the U S world around, around departments. So I may have, I will still have a leadership meeting, but I will break it down to, um, to accounting and, uh, finance, uh, into operations and then into sales and marketing. And so that was kind of like the first step that we did. And look, you know, one of the things I would make sure of is operations includes property accounting, just because it says the word property accounting doesn't mean it should fall in the accounting uh, and finance side. I think that the um, that the operations, the property accountants should sit in the operations meeting. Anything you'd add there, Graham? hundred percent. You know, you can obviously imagine as the, the company grows and scales, um, you know, today Spencer runs a marketing meeting that is, you know, separate and different from a sales meeting just because of, again, it's, you know, way beyond the kind of three to seven, um, heads kind of, you know, threshold that you just talked about, Matthew. Um, so you can imagine it just kind of like continues to break apart further and further. That's also where the communication friction comes in. You know, there's people that are inside of silos that may not know what's happening over in another part of the business. And so, you know, really making sure that you're cascading information well, both up and down throughout the organization, and that the leaders of those uh, of those separate meetings are doing a great job of communicating, um, you know, at you know, some kind of like higher level, uh, which for us would be our, our leadership meeting. Yeah, especially if you are have remote team members, like when we were all in one office, we were running to running into each other in the hallways. We were talking to each other. We were sharing offices. So everybody knew what was going on. The communication was happening all the time. And now that even, you know, if you're in a market, you pro you might even have remote team members that are in the city, but working from home or working in a different location, like the communication becomes paramount. Yeah. There's a great graphic out there that shows like, as you add one person, all the different types of, or, or the different, if you drew a line to each person, how the communication gets more and more complex. And I think it goes from like two people to nine. And it's just shocking how many, how like full those lines are um, and how complicated an organization just going from two to nine people uh, can become. The other thing I would say as you grow your organization uh, is making sure that people aren't in more than two level 10 meetings. We think about to being in two huddles and two level 10s. You just don't want people constantly in level 10 meetings. It's frustrating to them. Uh, they don't really get their work done, but it, but you can imagine maybe a property accountant would be, uh, you know, in the, uh, operations level 10 and may also be in the accounting level, uh, you know, accounting and finance level 10. Um, and so making sure that people aren't just overwhelmed with this level 10 meeting, but making sure that they're in the right meetings to add the right value so that you're um, being really efficient. And so in these other meetings, Matthew, I'm just looking like I have a scorecard 
for marketing. Sales has That's a right. scorecard for sales. I don't know, like Graham, do other departments as well? Like I know that obviously sales and marketing do, but I'm guessing accounting does and everybody else does because everybody in our company has their own personal scorecard, like a number that they are responsible for. Definitely. Definitely. So we break it down. We've got um, regional and market level scorecards for each one of our locations um, and the market scorecards are, you know, uniform across every, every geography. Um, but then, as you said, departmentally, we also roll up and, you know, operations has their specific scorecard, the resident communication team is accountable for, you know, delinquency and renewals, et cetera, um, responsiveness. Um, the leasing team has their separate scorecard where obviously we're, we're breaking down, you know, on the, on the company level scorecard, it may only be, you know, the median days on market, but there's three, four or five other metrics that we could be tracking. And the leasing team is definitely tracking those. So, um, you know, there's a, I'm sure thousands, millions of ways to, to measure your business. Um, you just need to be thoughtful about, as Matthew said, the, the analogy of the person, you know, the business owner who's on the desert island, you can't look at a thousand different KPIs. You could probably really, you know, conceptually track, you know, five, 10, 20, um, you know, we've got a fairly complex business at this point. So, you know, we've got 20 on our scorecard. Could it be shorter? Yes. Um, you know, for the, you know, 100, 500 thousand door property manager, it's probably, you know, 10 plus or minus three is what you should be measuring. Yeah, I would think of like a department level scorecard or a market level scorecard. Just this, I would ask the same question. If this market is my responsibility and I was on a desert island, or if this department is my responsibility and I was on a desert island, what 10 numbers or eight numbers would I need to know to make sure that that market or that department is tracking accordingly? Mm -hmm. And then that's how you build that scorecard. Yeah. And then just knowing that when you're meeting in these level 10s, you only want things on that scorecard that you intend to drop down if there's a problem, right? So like, hey, if some if a number has continually been off, you want to drop that down and talk about it. Yeah, that's the right. The opposite being, if you can ignore it and it's not a big deal, then why is it on the scorecard at all? It's just taking up space. Yeah. And I think even going back to why, why I love scorecards is even going back to Graham's initial point is your A players want to keep score. Your A players want to be on a team that's winning. And it's very, very easy as your company starts to grow for people just to like, I'm not saying they're intentionally hiding, but it's easy to kind of get lost and not be responsible for one number. And so if everybody on your team has a number and it's feeding into a scorecard, whether it be departmental or company scorecard, it just, there's a greater degree of accountability. And, uh, you know, to me, this is a, a great way to foster encouragement and team and, Hey, if I see Trey Griffin busting his tail, that's a huge encouragement to me because I see other members on the team who are like working very, very hard to, to succeed. Something else I want to add to that is explaining why, right? There may be somebody on your team that's new or somebody that, you know, has been in one seat and is moving to a different seat um, in another department or, you know, another part of the business. And so don't take for granted that everybody on your team knows why these numbers matter. Um, you know, making sure that, uh, especially new team members under, you know, they know everything on the company scorecard and they know why we're tracking it. Um, you know, the why is a, a super important part of motivation. And, you know, if you're just kind of like you know, trying to hit some number, but you don't see why it matters in the big picture, then you may be less motivated to try to you know hit your goal. Yeah, I think uh, just to piggyback on what you said, everybody's one number. They should know how it contributes to the big picture and the, how the organization all fits together. Uh, we were talking to our team yesterday, and one of the things I said is everybody wants to contribute to something. And so we've got to be able to tie, you know, if you're an application underwriter or if you're a property accountant, we got to be able to tie that to the success of Evernest. And so um, as we're talking about it, I'm just thinking, oh man, are we doing that everywhere? So maybe we need <laughs> to step it up as well. Yeah. Uh, All right. Think, yeah, I was just going to say, what do you, 
I think that we could do a better job on leading indicators versus lagging indicators. That's the other part mm -hmm. of this that we haven't necessarily touched on. You know, um, churn and, you know, units lost. Um, obviously, you're not going to get that owner or that property back. So thinking about whenever we possibly can about going upstream of those things and measuring the inputs that ultimately, you know, led to that churn. And I think that Everness could probably across the board do a better job of, of uh, tracking inputs, not always outputs. Um, there's a bunch of different ways in different departments that, um, you know, that you could be a little more proactive and getting ahead of problems before they, they show up on the scorecard potentially. So give us an example of that, Graham. Give us one example of how somebody listening to this podcast could be more proactive. Sure. So on the sales front, if you're measuring the number of doors or owners or, you know, property management agreements signed, well, the classic example would be kind of going back upstream and, you know, measuring the leads that you're generating and measuring, uh, obviously your close percentage is, is helpful. Those two are kind of decompose the number of units that you're bringing in. But is your, uh, if you're doing sales, are you setting a certain number of meetings per week, right? If you know what your close percentage is historically, you're setting a certain number of meetings per week or, you know, the number of outbound emails per week, or, you know, maybe you're measuring how many phone calls or how quickly you're getting back to yeah, responsiveness. Weeks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We, we've been talking about that a lot lately, just like, Hey, making sure that the sales team is thinking about that and tracking and just thinking, always thinking about how quickly they're getting back to leads, because that's absolutely something you can look at. Because if if that starts to drop off and people aren't getting back to people in you know an hour or less, then you're probably going to start seeing your sales start to slump off uh, over time. Especially one house, one owner kind of uh, kind of new clients, right? They're gonna you know send a couple of different emails or call a couple different different folks and you absolutely need to be the first person to call that, call that person back or pick up the phone the first time. Yep. All right, Graham, man, thanks for being here. Appreciate your expertise. I think we could have him back, Matthew. What do you think? We'll think about it. Uh, we'll see what the response is to this. I also want to say, <laughs> Hey, Mrs. Robinson, uh, enjoyed hanging out with you a month ago. I hope you, I, your son did awesome. So, um, you know, <laughs> he, well, he wasn't nervous at all. No, he crushed it. Hope this part doesn't make the podcast. <laughs> it definitely will. <laughs> All right, everybody, listen, if you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast and go to our webinar page, everness.co uh, backslash webinar and register for our sales webinar. The great thing, what like what I loved about the webinar we just had, Matthew, is how many questions people got to ask. We answered yeah. over 30 questions from people, and that is what we really like about the format, the webinar format. And our sales and marketing team landed 500 doors in January. And so if you want to find out how we did that, uh, we're going to share some of that on that two-hour webinar. That's right. All right, everybody. We'll be back next week with another episode of 300 to 3,000.